And welcome everybody. When Craig first asked me to introduce Gina Apostol, I tried to tell him maybe try to find someone else <laughs> because I haven't read all her novels and I felt that I will not be able to faithfully represent her as a novelist and award-winning author. And it's a little bit overwhelming. A quick Google search confirms my reluctance. Gina Postol, writer, author, novelist, educator, activist, Filipina. Winner of two Philippine National Book Awards for her first book, Bibliopsy, and The Revolution According to Raimundo Mata, republished in 2021, then Gun Dealer's Daughter, which won the Penn Open Book Award. Her most famous novel is perhaps Insurrecto, published in 2018, and was in many, if not every, top 10 list of books the year it was published, including Publishers Weekly and The New York Times. So we'll get to know her novel, her mo most recent novel slash memoir, I think, La Tercera, which was published last year. This book must be sold out since I've tried in vain to order it since the beginning of the year. She most recently won the 2022 Rome Prize in Literature to write her next book on the tragic lives and loves of Paz and Juan Luna. She's here with us as the 2024 Inouye Chair for Democratic Ideals at the University of Hawaii, Manoa, which is sponsored by the American Studies Department. <laughs> and there are many more essays, short stories, awards, fellowships, too many for me to mention here now. All these accolades are well known, but since this is a brown bag biography lecture, let me briefly mention my own biography or little story in terms of my connection to Gina and her work. I think I just got tenure here at UH when I received a package in my office. When I opened the package, it was a, a book entitled Gun Dealer's Daughter by Gina Postol. There was no note or forwarding address, so at first I thought, wow, this is really the perks of being a tenured professor. You just get free books all the time, right? But then I reflected and I thought, hmm, maybe somebody thought that I should read this book. I haven't heard of Gina Apostol then. I set this aside the book for years, unfortunately. And then a few years ago, another package arrived, and this time it was a book called Insurrecto. <laughs> At this point, I already had the luxury to read books that I didn't have to, and so I didn't wait for years, but read Insurrecto right away. And after that, I revisited Gun Dealer's Daughter. Instead of just waiting for my mystery mailer to send me <laughs> the revolution according to Raimundo Mata and La Tercera, I purchased them myself except that I haven't received letters there yet. I still don't know who sent me those books, but I'm very grateful because they introduced me to Gina Postol. It's possible that they were sent by publishers hoping that I use books in, her, in my classes, but I'd like to think there's something more metaphysical or <laughs> mystical about these packages because it really made sense that I read her books. First, she writes about history, and her books encapsulate the power of fiction to not only teach us about history, but to transport us through historical episodes. I, as a historian, I love reading novels and fiction because they give, give us texture, you know, the, the sights, the smells, the touch of things, events as they were imagined by the author and the concrete lives of the people who bring that history alive. And Gina's works focus on those periods of Philippine history that are painful and sometimes forgotten or unremembered, like Marcia Law, the revolution against Spain, the Duterte regime, and especially the Philippine American War, which was a preoccupation for a major backdrop of more than one of her novels. There are many ways to describe these historical journeys. Critics, readers, and her followers variably call them hypnotic or intoxicating, sometimes vertiginous or dizzying, yet dazzling, and yet playful and riotous. But they're always unsettling, ferocious, ferocious and meditative. While they are historical, her novels break the barriers of time and chronology as they are fragmented, moving us from past to present, then and now, and disturbing the line between truth and fiction, making us think and see how historical truths are determined by those who are telling stories. And second, she does all this with her playful and masterful use of language. All her books also take us on a multilingual journey. Filipino, Tagalog, English, Spanish, and Waray, her mother tongue. And while you can possibly understand every single word in her book, her books create worlds that you can relate to and open 
up new realities to you. And sometimes these plain words are just found in the names of her protagonists, which I really love. They're great, you know, Primi Peregrino, Cassiana Nacionales, Magsalin, Raimundo Mata, all carefully chosen, both historical and fictional, and all full of meaning. And finally, all her novels highlight the central role of women in history. This is also one of my passions, to unsilence the voiceless and faceless Filipinas who have been marginalized in Philippine history. In Gina's novels, women are the ones making history. They are at the center, and they are empowered, and I really love that. So now we're in for a treat, as Gina will talk to us about her inspiration in writing her latest book, Letter Sarah, and especially about the woman who has been central to her own story and history. So let's all welcome Gina Costa. I had last seen Vina at, a, at an event in, in New York, and um, I know I went there because precisely because of that um, interest in women um, that her talk was about. So thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, and I appreciate all of you for being here. Uh, thank you very much for being here. I'm going to start off with the epigraph of with two poems that begin La Tercera. Despedida kan Kirikay. Goodbye to Kirikay. Lakat na lakat na lakon ba lakat ka? So koman, so koman ipis ka ngayon. Lakat na la, diya ka yung mababara ka. Nandi hai mo magbibilin. Ang budo, ayaw pagdada. Ang bahaw, ng duwag. Layas na kung malayas ka. Diri matangi sa lang ka lang. Kapara na kapara na haapag panimplat. Pahirayo, di akain mag-aawin. Pakanto na, gikan ha ha yung lurop ng dagat. Bisbog ko ton kayong bukawin. Di rin ka na yung Paturo ng pagpaglakat. Ibilin ka layo, tubig. Di akain maglalang. It is a poem by, um, this is a poem by Eduardo Macabenta. And I, I would have preferred not to uh, translate it. But I got also uh, a great Filipino um, writer, uh, Merli Alunan, a poet who speaks, I don't know how many languages she speaks, but she um, translated Despedida Cantiricai by this um, early 20th century poet. Um, in what I and I will tell you this in terms of what I I did not read what I until I was quite old I spoke what I since I was a child but I did not read what I at all when I was growing up go go if that's what you want I don't care I don't care where just go I don't care I won't be looking for you you can't bring the salted fish in what I budo is a very funny word budo budo bulan the leftover rice, the ladle, and that's anbaha ngandwag. Go, go if you must. I won't be grieving about it for sure. Get out, out of my sight. Go away. I'm not going to miss you. Leave now, leave. Jump in the sea if you will. If a conch gobbles you up, that's fine too. But I'm not stopping you. Go on, get going. Just leave the fire behind, the water. I'm not chasing you after, ever. So that line, Ibilin Kalayo Tubi, I just find that so funny. I mean, so much of this is just um, very uh, common language that for what I people, you don't expect to see, to, to hear in poetry. And Eduardo Macabenta just does that. And I'm gonna read the second one. It's a what I folk song. Inday, inday, nakain ka, han ka sunog, han munika, pito ka tuig ang paglaga, an aso waray kita. Inday, inday, inday means child, girl child. <clears throat> Where were you when the doll burned, flaming for seven years? No one saw the smoke. And that poem, that song has been, I, I find it very moving to read that song because I, read, I heard that song for quite some time as a child and I did not understand what it was about. And apparently that, that song is a song, you know, sung um, as a lullaby, but it is about smoke, it's about fire, 
and it's about a doll burning. And what people have said, and it may not be absolutely true, because, but fiction to me, also, I, I keep talk, telling this to my students, the concept of Ronir, these, um, uh, this Borgesian concept of, of fake things that become reality. But this song uh, reverberates for the Warais as a song that comes down from the events of the Philippine-American War, the burning of Samar in 1901, um, when after a raid by Filipinos in the town of Balaniga, 48 U.S. soldiers were killed, and in retaliation, the Americans burned the towns of Samar, as the general of that time said, General Jacob Howling, Wilderness Smith, Smith, Wilderness Smith said, um, uh, <clears throat> make of Samar a howling wilderness. And the Americans killed around 30,000 people. And um, the <coughs> song is a memory of that time, but it's a lullaby. The Delgados are a fretful clan, prone to delusions of pathos rather than grandeur. We linger on the abstract, such as despair and pride. I speak of the Delgados I know, my mother's family, madmen and collaborators, so I'm told. By the time I had come across my mother's inheritance, the banality of objects in the material world inhabited by her grandfathers had lost for my mother even the sense of the ridiculous. She had ceased to see them. Instead, the memory of La Tercera, a place she had never known, drove her mad. I grew up under the shadow of La Tercera. It was a legacy not quite tangible, but not improbable. And this ambiguity has led members of my family through generations to acts that have ended in a sense of loss that burdens too many in the place I am from. So just a few things about what um, Bina said about my novels. They fuck you over in the sense that um, I, I'm very interested, I am very interested in history, but I'm also very interested in how novels are shaped. I'm very interested in form. And the way I construct my novels is through thinking about, I think about, I always know the ending of my novels. And the ending of the novel is always like something stupid, like I know, that I know the next novel that I am writing, it'll end with a woman either closing a window or a door. I know that. I don't know how she's going to get there. So I'm just telling you that right now. That's what's going to happen. <coughs> Um, I don't know how it'll happen. With Gundular's daughter, I knew it was going to end with a carousel. It was going there. It was going to be a merry-go-round, and I didn't know. I didn't know how the merry-go-round was going to happen. I did know that there was something about the circle. There's something about the circle, that geometry that Gundular's daughter was about. Similarly with Insurrecto, I knew it was going to end with karaoke. You know, so karaoke. There were two people were going to be singing karaoke, and. Um, actually, my publisher, um, the editor, one of the editors of the book said, Gina, you know, the, the, the last sections of um, part two of Insurrecto is driving me crazy. It drove me nuts. Uh, Viet Tan Nguyen also said, Gina, it is a mind fucker. So, um, so what happened was the, the, the ending, my original ending, my original uh, part two of Insurrecto was, here's the script of one person, and here's the script of the other, and you don't know who's saying what. And there's nothing, there's no breather. And that, I realize, I'm, lis I'm, I'm also a listener to, um, to readers, especially um, if they're gonna pay me. Uh, but no, um, no, but I thought, that is so smart, this editor said, so why don't you have them just go to Balangiga? So if you notice, if anyone's read Insurrecto, there's a whole series of chapter one, there are like 24 chapter ones. Um, and that is the, the journey to Balangiga. Because I, I got so excited when the editor said, why don't they go to Balangiga? I said, yeah, I, yes, they should go to Balangiga because they can still sing karaoke at the end. Um, so it didn't disturb my idea of my novel. Um, so 
I think about form so much, it's really weird um, when people ask me about, you know, myself in my novels. Um, and I, and I imagine, because this is true, I think, of all writing, that the self is always part of it. For me to say myself is not in Insurrecto or myself is not in gun dealer is bullshit. Um, but it is not consciously so. Because those novels are, another thing that I like to do is constraints. What is my constraint? Because that allows me to keep writing. Because anyone understands here what writing is all about. There's this goddamn blank page, and you need to goddamn fill it. And it's really terrifying. It's constantly terrifying to be writing a novel. And, what I, and, and a novel is so long, so it requires um, it requires an ability to sustain um, your energy, your desire, and so on. And what I do is I use constraints, I have boundaries, and they're quite arbitrary. Insurrecto, the, co the constraint of insurrecto was Googling. If I could Google it, it's gonna be, it could be in the novel, which is a really nice constraint because it's very amorphous, it's very big. It allows a lot, but it's also telling you, don't, yeah, yeah, no, I, I read that in a text. You know, in a book, and I, I mean, if, if it can be Googled. So, um, so the web aspect of Insurrecto really comes from that constraint. And it was really glorious to do because I found Gus the polar bear. I, I, you know, the, the, you know I, I, the, I, he's, I called him the bipolar bear because he was an actual polar bear in the Central Park Zoo. Um, and because I found him, I had my character living next to the zoo. I mean, you find all these things to do because of the because of the material, because of the constraint that you have. And Gus, the polar bear, bipolar bear, was a bear who was given Prozac because he was so depressed by the death of his partner bear, Ida. And it turns out Ida is also the name of William McKinley's wife. So it was very good. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so there are so many serendipities that can happen if you're very open both to your constraint and possibility. Um, so uh, um, the, this novel is very different. Um, I had been writing a novel called William McKinley's World for quite some time. And it was very hard to write because there were going to be two brothers a, a revolutionary and a spy, and they were, something's going to happen because um, someone had to kill someone. Um, and I knew someone was going to kill someone. And I had to move into that space where the two brothers were going to kill someone. Um, and I found it very difficult, so I kept have, going on recess, and recess for me is writing another novel. So I kept moving into Insurrecto. So Insurrecto, I kept, do, I kept going on recess. I finally published Insurrecto. I never finished William McKinley's World. And I was stuck. I was going home for a book festival, um, and it was the first time I was going home uh, for just my books. I always went home for my family. And I started crying on the plane. I, I just felt so weird thinking about my mother. I hadn't thought, well, I do think about my mother a lot, but I, I hadn't felt this weight um, that I felt on that plane. And I didn't realize what it was also. It was her 20 year anniversary. Um, and I did think about it because you don't think about those things. So I was there on the plane, and then, of course, I'm such an annoying person. I started thinking of William McKinley's world, and I thought, yeah, yeah, that's, there's a way into the novel um, that, that, would, that would give me the charge. Because in researching William McKinley's world, I had ended up, because I need, I need to attach you know, that's another thing. I need to attach. Therefore, all of my novels have a Warai person in it. Because <laughs> it's a way for me to be home in my novel. So there's always a Warai person. And to research the, um, the Philippine-American War, William McKinley's world, I was very interested. What made me want to write this novel, I was very interested in that moment in, Phil in the Philippines when um, so everyone has a power, is speaking the power language or wanting to learn the power language Spanish. And then suddenly, it doesn't matter anymore, you have to learn English. And that weird shift, and language for me is such a big part of the way I think about the world because of the way I grew up. Um, 
you know, speaking so many different languages. That shift in speech for me was like, whoa, that's, that's a paradigm shift, you know, to move from Spanish to English like that. And I realized my mom's favorite relative, whom I always thought was a bullshit guy, um, her, his, her Lolo Paco was a person who probably lived in that period. So, um, in, so to, to get to attach to my novel, William McKinley's World, I started researching her Lolo Paco. And my mom would say this about Lolo Paco, you know, he, oh, he was so he was my favorite uncle, he was I was his pet, I was spoiled by him, he was a senator, he was an ambassador, he was this and that. Yeah, right. He's a senator, he's an ambassador. Because the thing is, my mother is from a very, 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 very teeny tiny town in Leyte, not the capital. I grew up in the capital, in Tacloban, which is already, you know, very small and very provincial, very insular. But she was, she was in a river town that was inland. Um, it had no electricity in 1972, when, which is the first time that I, um, no, I visited, I, I arrived back in the States, 1971. We were in the uh, uh, we were in the States my first my early years, and then my mother um, returned. So in the 70s, it had no electricity. Um, the toilet in my mom's um, ancestral home was uh, like you're you're shitting into the river, and then my brothers would swim in the rivers, and they would keep wanting me to it's like no, you know. Um, uh, and so it was a very, for me, it's the most sensual, most sensual experience I've, I've had, and still until now, living in my mom's hometown. It was very much when I read 100 Years of Solitude. Okay, that's Macondo. You know that that is it's a it's an incredible town. Um, with, and it it got electricity only after Cory, 1994. Uh, 19, yeah, 1994, around that time. Um, and so I said, nah, your great uncle was not an ambassador to the United Nations. Um, but so I did start researching, and it, and it, and it was. You know, I was very disappointed um, to see that my mom's great uncle, her favorite relative, was a very early collaborator with the American regime. It's not good for a writer um, who's writing about anti-imperialism uh, to have that kind of relation. Um, I kept reading about him, and it's true, he was a child. He was around 16. He was born 1886, so um, uh, in 1903, when he was one of the, there's a group the way America um, imposed its um, power on the country was through, a lot of it was cultural hegemony to like hegemonic ways of, so one of them was education. Um, and they had this pensionado system where they sent Filipinos to the United States and they went through. Um, so my, uh, her, my mom's great uncle, Lolo Paco, uh, and I used his name, I used my mother's family name, Delgado. So Francisco Delgado um, is easy, it turns out he was easy to find because he was a government official, therefore he was all, he, it's in the U.S. Congress um, records. And he, in 1903, at the age of 16, he went to Stockton to, to learn English a bit more. He was, Filipinos were already learning English at the time. Aguinaldo's um, nephew, Badomero Aguinaldo, was already, already spoke English. Um, so um, so he, he, he smooths up his, Eng his English at Stockton, that's what I imagine. Then he went to college in Indiana. He graduated from Yale Law School in 1907, and he came back to the country and was one of the very early bureaucrats. It was hugely disturbing and disheartening to see this attachment that my mom had to someone whom, if you look at it, on one hand, um, was an enemy of the nation, in one sense. On the other hand, it, it really complicates one's relationship to, um, to the Filipino relationship to colonization. Because what is it that a 16-year-old 
<laughs> you know, who's trying to um, to do something with his life, and he's been given this opportunity. What do you do? And I had to figure out that world of the of that boy, uh, Lolo Paco. Um, uh, so and and so I thought when I was crying over this um, return home, here's what you do. You just be very honest with it. You know, you just move into that space of, of um, horror and complicity. And you foreground your mother. So I, for I decided this is what I was gonna do. I was going to invert my story. Um, the brothers were going to be in the background because I also, I think partly the reason why I found the brothers hard was I really do have, in terms of the woman's voice, I really believe in it. To move into the woman's voice is the way to go deeply into matters of revolution, resistance, and struggle. Um, so, so, and I had, and I decided to go with the first person um, looking back at the mom. Um, and I did not go home for my mother's funeral. Uh, so it's about a woman who's going home to her mother's funeral. Uh, so I gave myself that gift. You can do that as a writer, um, uh, of going home to my mom. And, uh, and I used and, and the constraint that I had for this novel, and it was really, I, I did it because I knew how difficult it would be. If, it, if I thought it were true, I'd put it in. Um, and you know what that is for a writer. It is the worst possible thing to be doing. Because what I, a lot of times, for instance, with my novels, the things that people find really moving, etc., are the things that I absolutely make up. If it's something, if it, if I put it in and I was like, oh, yeah, it's, I, I don't know, it's something that I wanted to be faithful to something, it's usually, it's usually quite false. I think I, that's been my experience as a writer. Um, it's usually quite false. So it was for me like. Um, a challenge to myself because I thought it needed it. And also, here's what, here's the other thing about writing, because I wanted to. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start crying. I, I wanted to remember my mother. No one would be writing a novel about a woman in a teeny tiny town with no electricity who has a weird, here's, here's, I fought with my mother throughout her life, and one of the reasons why it has been problematic is because she loved the Marcuses so much. She loved Imelda. She grew up in Imelda's hometown, Tacloban. That's where she went to school. She went to Imelda Marcus's high school. She knew Imelda. All of her friends were Imeldifics. Here's one thing about my mom. She was not a real Imeldific. In, in Tacloban, Imeldific is someone who is in Imelda's backyard, always going around with her because you could, um, especially her generation, because that's my mom's generation. To my mom's credit, she was not in a in a material way. She wasn't a hanger-on, but she loved her, and I hated it. For a long time, especially during the marches, um, uh, for in the 1980s, I really, I really didn't want to talk to her. At the same time that my mom was not the kind of person who would, you know, reject in any way anything that I was. <clears throat> I do have that privilege as a child, um, the sense of a person absolutely loving you and also telling you, no, you will go to church. No, you will. No, no, you don't much. Don't much, don't much, I mean, she was doing all of these things, but at the same time that um, she, I always marched, and she knew I was marching. Um, uh, I didn't, I lied to her about going to church, but, um, uh, but, so I had to figure out the attachment to authoritarianism, the attachment to the colonial, the attachment to the imperial, 
um, she didn't like America, which is kind of interesting. Um, she hated American chocolate, and she, she's a war baby. She's a World War II baby. She would never eat American chocolate. It was interesting. Um, so she was a very um, interesting person um, in terms of all of her complications and contradictions. Um, uh, and so I ended up doing that, and and then it turns out that as I was I made this decision, the pandemic happened. So I was there at home, just mourning my mother, writing about my mom, <laughs> teaching remotely, and I um, I finished my novel. Um, I felt this charge of memory, and I think the pandemic probably heightened it because um, there was so much loss in the world. And I think I went with that loss in my memory of my mom. Okay, I'll, I'll read a few things. <clears throat> The voicemail was from my uncle, Chunumarino, the honorable mayor, as they called him years after his regime. My mom's family were, po were small-time politicians in my hometown. So I do wonder about the lack of electricity in my hometown, since my family were politicians there. Um, I've been calling my mother the entire month. She had no use for messenger. Skype was dead to her. She owned no computer. She was the last woman in that selfie-happy archipelago to have only a rotary phone. All I had was her voice. It was girlish, high-pitched, the voice of one I thought who believed too easily in illusion. My mom lived in the future, and the present was a dislocation. She had the trick of making you think it was your existence that gave her joy, partly because of her childish voice, her intakes of breath as she spoke to you, as if her diaphragm and lungs were not formed enough for her thrill. In die, she said when it was first detected. I'm so healthy, I just had my tests. She always called me Indai, sounding like she had so many children she had forgotten my name, though I am her only daughter. But mom, Trinamor said, my heart is good, my cholesterol is great, my lungs are perfect, all I have is cancer. Without cancer, I'm on top of the world. And she began to hum that song for my childhood. I could see her doing the cha-cha with the cord of the rotary phone, shaking her hips, dressed in satin and silk, lithe and unconquerable in her feline way, like the stray cats that perched on the unfinished cement walls in Mana Marga's dirty kitchen, purring in the security of having so many lives. When she was first told she should have, she, she should have surgery to take out her cancerous breast, she refused. How can you dance the tango if you have only one breast? I imagined her, Adina and Guapa, pearled and perfumed, dancing the cha-cha to Karen Carpenter in her high heels. I keep seeing her 70s bouffant, though in her last pictures, uploaded on Facebook by Put Put, who never tags me, but still I follow him, her hair has thinned. Her reflexive mode of existence was to go ballroom dancing. She wore high heels to water her orchids in the garden, and when I was a kid watching her use a brown eyebrow pencil to line her lips, she laughed as I stared. In Dai, she said, humming as she did the weirdest things to her face, her deft fingers etching herself into shape. Does it look good, In Dai, she asked. Yes, I'd say, and it was true. I grew up with the daring invention of my mom's daily routines. I grew up with the incoherent details of Lolopaco's life and times. Lolopaco had no will, he had no child. When he died, who should inherit his properties but us, the children of his blood, of his only brother, Jorge Delgado y Bloomfeld, my papa's papa, your lolohote. I grew up with them while I scraped out burnt ice, rice at the bottom of the caldero or slapped at bugs that got through the mosquitero's gauze no matter how firmly my mom tucked me into bed. Minor acts or objects would set her off, such as food. Once the particular luster that day of her favorite, fresh, fresh hipon, the smelliest stuff on the table, I thought, though I was too polite and in awe of my mom's appetite to mention it, reminded her how much her lolo paco had loved the hipon of leite, which he called bagoong, and among the bundles that her father, Mr. Honorable Mayor Francisco Delgado III, would take on his annual pilgrimage to her lolo paco at Green Hills were those jars of purple sheen, salogos hipon, wrapped in multiple layers of banig so that if they spilled, the gusts of hipon would not ruin her father's clothes. 
Stolopako also loved dangit, dried squid, and all the most awful kinds of buru bulat. Basically, he had a taste for smelly things. And I see my grandfather, the honorable mayor, also the town's old music teacher, lugging the weight of his bounty from Salugu's dust to Tacloban's gangplanks to Manila's piers. I kept imagining with a sense of my own humiliation, this proud man, my mom's papa, arriving at his rich uncle, the senator's doorstep, stooped, sweating, and reeking of pusit to deliver his homage of fermented shrimp fry and salted fish, the province's bounty offered to Manila's gods. So, uh, every year when she had to pay the school bills to the Divine Word Missionary School for my dumb education, my mom mentioned how she could have gone to high school in Manila, you know, and not just college at Far Eastern University in Sampaloc. Anyway, she never graduated from FEU because she refused to wear sneakers during PE, but that's another story. If only her papa had allowed her to live with childless Lolo Paco and his mean wife Lola Chedeng when he asked to take her, he wanted to adopt her when she was just a baby. Oh, instead, who got to be the child growing up at the senator's dinner table. Oh, that cripple, that orphan, that Madame Charity Britton. Oh, that poliomyelitic. Oh my goodness, Idai. Idai, how could she call herself a Delgado? She could not even walk. Again, a poliomyelitic, an American with, that, with no name, left behind by a GI, a ward of the orphanage, and no name saved by the Gotas de Leche. I leche that Gotas de Leche. So it's a little bit, it's a lot of that is actually my mom's voice. She was really annoying. Um, uh, of the way you could hear, you know, and as a child, hearing her talk about the, the crippled orphan who took away her inheritance was really the worst. Um, and, uh, but I imagine that this is a lot of it is the experience of martial law baby. The experience of people who so support a horrendous state, who so support a hugely problematic culture. And what I had to do was figure out what the connection was to the Philippine-American War. Okay. So the two brothers, um, who are in the war. Hote is one of them. And that really is the name of one of my mom's um, uncles. Um, um, none of my, I kept looking, I have to say I looked very hard, but none of my family were revolutionary. <laughs> they were collaborators. I think even with the Japanese. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so I had the one brother be a revolutionary, and I followed the career of her Lolo Paco and tried to imagine what, what it would be like to be in tandem where, uh, with revolution and then occupation, and what, what are the entanglements there, and what does it mean. And so uh, I'll, I'll just get to the point in terms of um, the thesis that I came to in writing this novel. Um, there is a direct connection between the genocide that happened in the Philippines in the Philippine-American War by the American forces and the um, attachments, the misidentifications that Filipinos have with terror, <laughs> with, with fascists. I think there's a connection between the huge lack of information that is available on the Philippine-American War from the Filipino side. In my research on the Philippine-American War, and I don't know if it's true with you, um, the stories are from American soldiers. The stories are from the congressional records. The stories are from the women travelers to America. The stories are from um, I mean, I've read the memoirs of, you know, Helen Taft, all of these people. The memoirs of the Philippine-American War by Filipinos are so few, you can't call them memoirs. Because one of them was the diary of Simeon Villa, the doctor of Aguinaldo. And that diary is found, again, this is, a, this is an interesting aspect of the irony of the historiography of the Philippines. The diary is found in the so-called Philippine insurgent or revolutionary records as part of captured military documents by the U.S. military. And it was captured, of course, because the Afghanistan uh, <coughs> forces um, tricked um, the Aguinaldo um, camp 
um, into their capture, and Bilya was tasked with just writing down the daily events of um, the Revolutionary Army against Aguinaldo, uh, with Aguinaldo, and his diary was captured on the day of Aguinaldo's capture in Palanan. Um, another uh, diary that apparently is available, and not even um, who Scott, I think, wrote um, the Il Ilocanos about the Ilocanos, and not even Scott, I believe, managed to get uh, what he said was the Inerita Cronica of um, I forget his name of one of the Ilocano generals. He's from Abra La Union. Um, has part one the Spanish War, part three um, the uh, what Filipinos. <laughs> Uh, in in Baray, Camurayo, it's called Pisa, the post-war, but it doesn't have part two, the American War. Um, I spoke to one of my um, one of my cousins, whose name is Peñaranda, said, Mano Bimboy, I found the name of someone named Florentino Peñaranda um, in the um, in the book on the war in Leyte, I'm so ex I, uh, do you do you know is he related to you? And he says, yeah, that's my great grandfather. I said, I'm so excited because I want to know his stories. Um, he was the Leyte general in the Philippine American War, one of the last generals to surrender, because the 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 Southern um, War went on a bit longer. Um, and so I was really excited uh, because I could get a story. And he says, we knew he was in the war. He spoke nothing about the war. And I said, well, can you ask your mother? Can you ask your aunts and uncles? And he did. And he actually wrote a little bit about it because he was a poet. Um, and he said, yeah, they have nothing either. There are lots of ways you can understand the silence on the war. There's obviously trauma, you know. Why remember something so painful? At the same time, why remember when you lost? You were captured. There is also the fact of counter surveillance and policing. The fact of possible death from telling or knowing someone's story, your story. The policing during the aftermath of that war in particular, which is part of what my novel is about, was truly um, fascist. It was truly a way of, a form of epistemicide in the words of that scholar on ancient Roman history and his, um, Ms. Daniel Padilla. I was in Rome, so I was at the American Academy, so I learned all about these things. And it was interesting to be at the American Academy and think about the ways current scholarship on ancient Rome is talking about those that are not heard. And this scholarship on epistemicide by um, um, uh, the, 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 the murder of knowing, modes of knowing, in um, the Roman territories that were occupied. Um, applying that to the murders of no, the murder of knowing, the killer of knowing, ways of knowing that the Filipinos would have about how they existed during that time of, of horror. Um, when they believed, and the, the thing about the, the war, and I, I realize I'm thinking about this as a novelist, but I think it's also useful to do that, you know, because a novelist has to think about the psychological moment. But to have the possibility of your freedom, you know, in 1898, you won the war against Spain, and then the people that had however misguided you were in thinking about their so-called amigo, um, uh, amigo relationship with you, to have it taken from you, and then you have to fight again. And not every Filipino 
was for this revolution. But every Filipino would have counted in the possibilities, in the freedom that would have been possible by this, um, by this revolutionary moment. So um, my novel ends up uh, really thinking about the thesis being that we remember the wrong people. A colonized people are going to remember the wrong people. A people that had been occupied will remember that, will have problematic heroes, will have the wrong heroes. My mom's hero was her Lolopako, which is fine, you know. I cannot completely say, you know, you know he was completely uh, an American stooge. He was the UN ambassador to, from the Philippines at the time that, you know, remember Khrushchev with the, with the shoe? Khrushchev, I, this is what I learned from my novel, Khrushchev was banging his shoe at one of the speeches of the Philippine delegation. It was about the, um, the statehood of Congo. They were being admitted into the United Nations. And the, Filipi the Filipinos were saying yes to the statehood of Congo, but going after Russia for its, um, its you know, imperial uh, stuff in, in Eastern Europe. For, not, for being anti-democratic, et cetera, et cetera. They were the voice piece for America. Even as they were saying, as Filipinos, we must go with Congo. Congo must be, was, must be given statehood. But at the same, so I, I was so happy to hear his voice in the UN audio. Oh, here, here's, here's, my, um, here's my mom's great uncle. And he was saying bullshit stuff like that, you know? Um, so, but you can hear also the ways in which the Filipinos were captured. You can imagine what was interesting in thinking about my mom Solopaco is the brilliances of the Filipinos that were captured to be stooges for American imperialist desire. Because that was a very smart boy. Those are very, very, um, able people that were taken. You need to see them in multiple ways. I need to see my Lolo Paco in multiple ways, in the ways of a, hu of a human surviving. But I need not say with my mom, I need not love him. But I will understand him. Because one has to go with the unknown. One has to keep speaking of those whose, whose names are not known. And so many people, if you think about any colonized group, any colonized world, people who have struggled, people who have fought, people who have died, you have to understand all the unknown geniuses that died in those wars. All the unknown people with desire simply to be human. And that's, I ended up doing that with this, where unfortunately, um, I, still, I still quarrel um, with myself as a writer because in order to tell the story, I did it with my mom's um, great uncle. Uh, and so his name is known, um, but the people whose names are not known, you learn about them in a very underhand way because of the way the story is told. There are other ways to tell the story, and I hope others will.
Or? Could I just say this is a very funny novel? <laughs> I can read the funny parts, but you know, it's 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 mostly funny. I can hear I can hear your mother when we talk about when when you said those excerpts, right? You know, so okay, go ahead. Thank you very much for how broad and deep was your explanation of the writing process in the book. I have two questions. One, when you talk to your mom mm -hmm. with love, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, she was uh, presenting the great uncle mm -hmm. with, uh, um, mm -hmm. with the, she was a little bit in awe of him. Mm -hmm. Were you able also, while listening to the story about the uncle, present the facts mm -hmm. to your mom? And how would she react in front of the um, friends? At the time when my mom, when my mom was alive, I, I hadn't done the research on my great uncle, so I didn't know anything. Oh. And I just considered. I mean, I thought it was like her stories about visiting the Virgin Mary and the Virgin Mary's crying. Um, you know, so she she would she loved to go out to the different islands and visit the crying virgins. Um, so. Um, I just saw. I, I thought her stories about her lolopaco were just as bullshit um, as the stories of the crying virgins. Um, so I would listen though, because I'm Filipino and you don't do <laughs> shit to your mom. I mean, your mom means so much, and there's so much power of your mom's love. And I would never. I would. I wouldn't. What I would say to her was, I am marching for Corey. I am marching for this, I am doing that. I would tell her. Uh, mm -hmm. Only in your yeah. yes, a question, I yeah. ask mine. Otherwise, yeah. they first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, hold on a second, I lost. Give me one second to recapture. Um, no, I lost it. Mm -hmm. Give me one second. No. It is tough, you know. Um, uh, yeah, go, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Um, the fascination <laughs> that your mom loved, you say, fascination she had for Imelda Marcos. Yeah. It's still uh, there for many people. In yeah, the it's a fascination that uh, is typical of, uh, uh, how can I say, trusting people, not excessively excessively uh, critical people to have a fascination for somebody in power because it's a kind of a metaphor for something divine almost, they confuse it. Yeah. What was the love she had for Imelda? Here, uh, the way I respond to that all the time is that I would never be, I would, I do not, um, okay, I will never, I cannot presume on the trustingness or knowingness or um, quality of knowing of truth of the people around me, <laughs> of people. I need to understand their knowing on their own terms. I, I cannot even completely um, say of those who still vote for the Marcuses, of those who still, or, or, or my, obviously because of my mom also, who still do things that I feel I can't understand. I will have to understand them on their terms. So even let's say the voters for Marcos, I need to understand what's going on in the society around me that, that, that gives them that need to go with something so obviously disfiguring of a kind 
of, of, of a truth, you know. The Marcuses are huge liars apart from being murderers. Um, so I would need to understand the voters, try to understand why they're doing that. And my condemnation would lie with the Marcuses. I would condemn the Marcuses. I would condemn Imelda Marcos. I would go after the state. I would go after the, the instruments of power that, um, that I think are those that are most at, um, that, are, that are doing the harm. So in terms of my mom's, I would, with my mother, I would just go into all the possible, all the different ways that I see. And I do, and I did in my novel go way back into um, the American period, into uh, Spanish colonization, into Catholicism, and ways in which the colonizing uh, epistemology, the colonizing ways of knowing get really embedded, and ways in which um, her own positionality uh, as a woman from this place, et cetera, et cetera, um, move her into, into whichever desires she has. Um, uh, so um, part of my novel's movement, I think, lies in ways in which um, you need to go back and forth as a reader in terms of thinking about, oh, I can't do that. I can't go with that at this moment. Oh, okay, now I understand her at this moment. So there'd be moments where your own ways of knowing will be maybe uh, discomforted, maybe upset, unsettled by, oh, okay, I'm understanding her at this point, at that point. Um, and I did go into quite difficult aspects of my mom's life because a, a woman's life in the Philippines, okay, the Philippines is like this, in my view. The Philippines is very matriarchal, but it's a misogynist matriarchal society. <laughs> um, there's a lot of um, interesting ways in which society is structured against women at the same time that women have so much power in the home. And, and there's no sense that a woman can't have power in public, you know. Um, the most uh, the most amazing writers of the of martial law period of the pre -march, of the pre martial law period of the current journalists they're all women you know there's nothing that keeps a woman from being from taking on her power really um, but there are ways that the society that society structures womanhood that is really um, when when you notice them like the my, I my mom was such a strong woman, you know. She believed in what she, she would, she would go with what her belief was. But she was so taken by the structures of her society. But she, she constantly resisted. So she had a difficult life. And I had to really, I had to dig into it because I couldn't, I couldn't, um, I couldn't address it when she was alive. And it was only when she died that my family started telling the story of her life. It was only when my mother died that she, they said, oh yeah, that's what happened to her. That. And so there's also that backstory of where your mom will never tell you. Um, and then when she died, there were all of these stories that came out. But they were all stories that we already figured were something had been happening, but we didn't know. Because the ways of knowing um, in terms of uh, social um, kind of relationships, you would, you would keep hiding certain things. There'd be a lot of hiding. Just as with the revolutionary moment, a lot of hiding of what you were doing during the war, whether you were collaborating or not collaborating, whether you were revolutionary or, or, or pro-American, there's a lot of secrets. There are a lot of secrets, you know. Um, so I, I cannot presume on, on those, on the desires of others. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, hi, yeah, hi. 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 Um, I have a question about your writing practice, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, 
particularly because if you're writing in English, because of course there's Philippine English, and there's American English, and there's book English. Plus, I guess you, you speak Warai, Tagalog, and maybe Bisaya. So when you're writing, which language are you thinking in? And are you writing, for example, American English for Warai, or are you writing yeah. Philippine English for America? Could you sort of right. talk about how you disentangle yes. all those I was going to actually read a section of the novel that actually talks about language because it's so much part of the novel. This novel has a lot of opacity. It has a lot of illegibility that the reviewer from the New York Times mentioned um, <laughs> because a lot of this novel, there, there are several parts where I don't translate the what I. I the what I is in there, but I'm not interested in translating it. I am more. In, I am actually interested in the opacity where someone might be. It might be intimate for someone, but it might be completely illegible for someone else. And I'm fine with that. I'm happy with that with this particular novel because of the again the constraints that I had for this novel, which was um, that one of the you know the, these things something that is true something that's. It was it very, it's, something, it's about my childhood, and so about how I thought about my childhood, how I, I would hear something. And so the, the way I heard words would be the, the, these moves from what I to English, et cetera, et cetera. And the novel itself um, has a lot also of, there's another, my, my books always have a translator. <laughs> there's always a translator character. Um, and so this one also has a translator character. I believe she's the hero of the novel. Um, but uh, uh, so this particular novel has a lot of um, what I in it. In fact, one of my, my editor was saying, you know, you know this particular um, sentence, here's a good way to make it more to make it clearer, as, and I was reading it. I, 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 my editor is a writer, so he's a really good editor. Um, I, li I like his work too, and so I listened to him, and I was see hearing, seeing what he was doing, but the sense of, no, 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 you don't understand, because um, I, I, I understood it, but I was <coughs> doing it quite unconsciously. I said, no, you see, did you see the pattern of gerunds there? It's, it's all gerunds, it's all verb verb-based nouns. What I is verb-based. You know, what I, the, the center, the syntactical center is the verb. And, and that's true also of Tagalog, I think. Um, the, the nouns are, you know, come from the verb. And so, um, uh, I, it's very deliberate because I'm, I'm, I'm following a what I way of doing that sentence. And my, and my, oh yeah, I get it, I get it, I'm sorry, you know, I, um, we'll keep that, we'll keep this, we'll keep that. So, um, that in this particular novel, I won't say that that's true of all my novels. You know, Gun Dealer's Daughter, for instance, she is an upper class Filipino who doesn't speak Tagalog. So her English is going to be different from the English of La Tercera, you know? So uh, it really does depend on the voice and the narration mode that I'm using. You know, this is first person. Insurrecto was a series of free and direct discourse. So that's gonna be a different. And that was very deliberate too because Insurrecto had many, many different characters speaking. And you had to figure out from the syntax going through whether that's going to be a Tagalog person in English, a Waray person in English or Tagalog, because the Waray person also has to do Tagalog, you know. Um, but uh, it need not be, I need not tell you that. You have to ask questions when you don't understand my novel. <laughs> And on that note, I'd like to make a couple of comments. Uh, first of all, uh, we're very lucky that Gina Apostol is going to be here for the semester. She's going to be giving a major talk on February the 22nd, I believe. It's, no, yeah, 6.30 on February the 22nd. She's also going to be doing a talk in Women's Studies, I believe, on March the 8th, which is the Friday. And we're hoping she's going to be involved in the panels and events we're going to be doing in mid-April in terms of the 1898 project, which as you've heard here is very relevant to her work. Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention, that was Rick Tamillos back there. I just wanted to congratulate him because he was named the Living Treasure of Hawaii. <laughs> I'm honored 
faculty member here and a major figure in music and musicology, uh, ethnomusicology. Um, and so I would like to have you all join me in thanking our reader for today. Thank you very much, Steve.